Uh, we are continuing our series on a fruitful life, and this morning we approach the attribute of peace. So, but can everyone hear me all right? Sure, in the back, everyone's good? Okay, because we have a portable microphone, but it's not the greatest. I think it's better if we can, if we can do it this way, this is the best. Um, but as we approach fruit and this, the fruit of the Spirit in us, uh, it is not us going to a farmer's market and, and sampling different fruit and saying, okay, I want to try this fruit or that fruit. Uh, this is, we are fascinated with subscriptions. We subscribe to uh, TV channels or media companies or butcher box or we get uh, subscribe and save on Amazon, all these things. And so when we approach the fruit of the Spirit, it is, it is like a co-op, if you will, or it is a subscription where you get all nine. You don't get to choose if you want to have love or if you want to be peaceful. You get love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control delivered to your door every week, every morning, actually, every moment of every day as a Christian. And so that is part of you being a follower of Christ. And so this series, we've been in Galatians, but we stop there. We stop where Paul says the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, patience, all those. And we're looking at them. We're spending a week, one Lord's Day, for each uh, attribute of the fruit of the Spirit. And this morning, we have landed on the fruit, the attribute of peace. Now, uh, peace is being in a state of tranquility. It is honestly quite peaceful this morning without lights on. It is uh, not as bright Uh, It's without conflict. That's what it means to be at peace. But our lives, as you know, we're we're constantly striving for peace. Uh, Our health declines and we we lose peace. Our our kids, we worry about them and we don't have peace in that situation. But but peace, we're constantly desiring it. And it's so fascinating that as we look at the Bible, as we we start in the book in Genesis, the Bible begins in peace. Begins in this peaceful garden where, God, where God's created beings are in his presence at peace. But then sin enters in the world, and then it's everything but peace. From, from Genesis to Revelation, it's this constant turmoil of, of conflict and rebellion, and then God sending prophets, and it's back to peace. And then they're looking forward to this, this one that's going to come, and then Christ comes, and, and then he, he dies, and it's where's the peace? And then he comes back, and he, he's there, yet not everyone believes. And then we get to Revelation... And he says, I'm, I'm coming back, and I'm going to restore all things. And there's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, where there is eternal peace. And so the Bible is essentially, from beginning to end, this, this guidebook on peace. And so this morning, we are just, we're on this journey, but we're stopping at Isaiah. And so uh, I'm going to invite you to uh, stand with me, as we always do. I'm going to read for us from the book of Isaiah Chapter 26, verses 1 through 6 this morning. Man, it's a lot easier to use a Bible than this technology. In the day this song will be sung in the land of Judah, we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as, his, as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps Faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. For he has humbled the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, the steps of the needy. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as always, we're thankful for your word. We pray now that you would guide this time that you would help us focus on your word and uh, be with us, Lord. Be with me as I speak. Let my voice carry so that it can be heard and through your power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, It is a wonderful, interesting that we don't have light because of technology, but we have Uh, notes on a screen that is battery powered and then I can record the sermon on a different device so that people at home can then get it later. So praise God for uh, the gift of technology. Uh, Isaiah opens five chapters contrasting 
rebellion and corruption with holiness and blessedness. And then we get to Isaiah 6, and that's a familiar chapter in Isaiah because there Isaiah gets this vision of God, and he realized that he is a man of unclean lips. And so we have this wonderful visual of Isaiah seeing the holiness of God, realizing how sinful he is, and that he can only be made pure by God. And so the people of Israel are in the same situation. They have to understand that they're sinful, they're, they're fallen, that they can only be made right by God. You and I have the same situation where we are, uh, in our sin, can only be made right by God. And so Isaiah rightly understood his sinful condition, and the people of Israel also need to understand that. And so then Isaiah chapter 7 through 39 is, is a lot of the relationship between God and his people hinging on their trust of him. Will God's people trust themselves or will they trust God? Oh, you and I know the right answer, but throughout Isaiah, we see God's people often impressed by people. They're, they're choosing to, to worship idols. They're choosing to trust in their own strength, not in the strength of God. And yet, in all this, God is faithful, as we often see throughout the Bible. And so, uh, I'm not going to make you turn there, but in Isaiah 24, the, uh, Isaiah prophesies judgment on the whole earth. Isaiah 24, verse 1, Behold, the Lord will empty the earth and make it desolate. He will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. We see the, that the Lord is in control. And then we get to chapter 25 of Isaiah, where the Lord now brings salvation. Isaiah is promi uh, promising salvation. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's Isaiah 25 leading up to our text this morning. Then we get to Isaiah 26, our passage this morning where Isaiah says, this is the song that will be sung in the land of Judah. This is what they're going to sing on that day. When, when they're delivered from their enemies, this is the song that they will sing. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation and, as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. He has humbled the inhabitants of the height, the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, cast it to the dust. The foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, the steps of the needy. And so the, the song in its most uh, basic sense is the Lord sets up salvation. The Lord sets up the walls of salvation, uh, open the gates so that the righteous can enter into the salvation. He keeps those whose mind is on him in perfect peace. What a beautiful promise. The Lord is an eternal rock. He humbles the high so the poor and needy walk over them. That, that is the song that we'll be saying when God's people are delivered from their enemies. And so, no surprise this morning, we're going to spend our time looking at verse 3 in Isaiah here. Because Isaiah says, you keep him, this is the song, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You keep him, that is, you protect him from harm, you keep watch over and guard the one in peace whose mind has stayed on you. The, the, it's translated in our, in our English Bibles as perfect peace. But in Hebrew, it's shalom, shalom. It's, it's peace, peace, essentially. And it, peace is interesting because we, tr we don't have a shalom in English. And so we say peace. But we belittle peace. We, we use the word as, as superficial as you can be. I mean, Wednesday night, the high school kids say, peace, bro, to me. And it's like this just superficial, uh, th there's no deep meaning there. There's no, uh, may it go well with you. May, may your life be at peace with the Lord. We, we don't get that when we throw the word peace around. But in this verse, it's shalom, shalom. And so we, we translate it as perfect peace. It's this, this peace that, that goes to our core. A peace that, that uh, lasts eternally. It's pure. It's, it's perfect. It's shalom, shalom. And, and Isaiah says, this is when your mind is stayed on the Lord. That is when you have this peace. When, when your mind is fixed on him. It is truly that simple. You, you, you could have walked in these doors this morning without any peace at all. Stuff going on at home, marriage, kids, finances, whatever. 
When your mind is fixed on God, Isaiah said, you are at perfect peace. It's a beautiful, beautiful promise. However, we abandon this peace. We, we let our minds wander away from the Lord. We're not fixed on him, and we, we start fixing our mind on worldly things. Uh, it, it, it's strange how quickly we allow ourselves to drift from the perfect peace of God to the things of this world and think that we have control over it. But the moment, the moment that our minds, we allow them to drift from the eternal God, the moment we are inviting, that's the moment we're inviting anxiety into our life. That's the moment we're anxiety, uh, inviting unrest into our life. We don't see it in the moment, but when we step back and look at it, uh, we realize that the situation where we were unloving, the situation where we were impatient, we were uh, worried, we were anxious. In that moment, we, we, we lost our focus on God and his eternal kingdom. We, we do not have the power, in, in our own power, I should say, to solve the problems, to bring peace to our lives. If we are going to be people marked by peace, we're going to be people that have minds fixed on God, as Isaiah says. And there's a couple things I want to do this morning. I want to look at a couple examples of how we fail and where we fail, so that we can be certain where our minds, where our hearts need to be focused, so that we can be at peace in this life. Because we know the world is crazy. There's chaos everywhere. But you and I can, must be marked by peace as Christians. So the first place I don't want us to look for peace and is in other people. In the book of Genesis, Lamech, he lived 182 years. He fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech had hope in a person. He had hope in his son that the curse, the fall, the, the thorns, the, the, the toil it takes to grow uh, fruit, to survive in this world, that his son would be the redeemer of that. Well, we know that's not true. We know that Noah was used by God certainly to, to preserve a remnant of a small number of people and animals and a boat, but he wasn't the one that would, would redeem them from the curse. That person would, would come, and that person is Jesus Christ. But the point is, Lamech had hope in a person. Uh, you and I probably don't. Maybe we have hope in our kids, but as soon as they start growing up, we, they bring us joy, certainly, but we don't expect our kids to, to redeem us. Uh, we, we may have hope in our spouse. Song of Solomon, chapter 8. I was in his eyes as one who finds peace. There are situ situations in our life when... Uh, our hope in people is escalated. It could be you're, you're, you dial 911 because you need the sheriffs or you need an ambulance. Our life circumstances escalate our hope in people. I remember being, uh, I was probably 12 years old, and we were at Lake Havasu, and my mom was big on experiences. She loved to, to do things and to make memories that we would remember. And so we went, uh, we, she signed us up to go parasailing. So that's the parachute behind the boat. They let the rope out like 12,000 feet, even though it's really like 100 feet. Um, it feels like 12,000 feet. Uh, well, bad idea. So I'm with mom, and uh, we're, we get at the farthest point. Everyone's waving, and everyone's so happy. And then she is convinced that her hook that is strapping her to this harness it is not hooked properly. And so mom is not doing well. And so she's like yelling at the boat and they're yelling back. Everyone's waving, thinking this is some happy interaction. And it's like, you think there would be a panic button. There, there'd be some universal sign that would bring us back down. Uh, but instead, her hope was in these people who are just yelling back and waving and taking pictures like we're having the time of our life. Um, so, but then it gets worse. Because now I'm 12 years old, and my mom is saying her goodbyes to her son, like she's going to fall from the sky. And it's like, Mom, <laughs> relax, okay? We're, we're going to be all right, I think, you know? Um, the point is, is that there are life circumstances that, that quickly escalate our hope in people. But humans can only do so much. Uh, it can draw us to this false hope. That's why we pray. It's why we pray to a God that can, can do all things. And, and you and I have to be careful, uh, not just when we have hope in other people, but uh, when people have hope in us. That's probably even more dangerous, especially those of us that have kids. Because our kids from, from birth, 
they run to us with a runny nose and a dirty diaper and a scab knee. And, and mom and dad are the heroes of the story over and over and over again. And that is a good thing. But if we aren't pointing our kids to Christ, if we remain the hero of their life, then we have failed our children. And so we, we have to always point hope to the one that can give hope, God himself and Christ. So we do not find hope in people. And the second place that we do not find hope and peace, I should say, is in material possessions. Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. He was at peace. Daniel 4, verse 4. But then you get to verse 5, and the peace is instantly gone. I saw in a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. In one verse, Nebuchadnezzar goes from peace in his palace to fear, and, and, and he's alarmed at this dream he has. He has all these possessions, all this comfort, yet in a moment it's gone. It makes no difference to him. It reminds us of Luke 12 in the parable of the rich fool, as we call it. Jesus is speaking a parable, and he says, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. He thought to himself, What shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We do not find peace in possessions. The rich fool had so much possessions, he built bigger barns, bigger storehouses, But then God says, tonight your soul is required of you. And whose things will these be? What what are you going to do with these things that that brought you peace, that you've stored extra of? Where is the peace now in those things? He says, don't don't, uh, live your life for those things. Live your life for God. We uh, are are guilty. We may not be as as extreme as the rich fool here, but, but you and I are guilty often of doing similar things with material purchases, of trying to find peace in material things. Uh, my wife and I, about five years ago, we uh, bought all new appliances. The, the used Craigslist appliances finally were going to go. All the, the repairs, the, the fixes were finally gone, and we now had peace in this material purchase. I can report to you, as of this morning, ice maker is not working. Uh, oven igniter... Number four, uh, new main control panel of the oven. I had to replace that a year ago. The dishwasher, the door doesn't latch properly, so it shuts off halfway through the cycle, and you've got to close it again. The dryer pulley went out, had to take that apart, and the microwave needed a deflector plate inside replaced. replaced. Uh, so every single appliance that we bought five years ago has been worked on. Our piece that I thought was going to last many years was not the case. But how often do we justify purchases because we think they're going to bring us peace? How often are uh, used cars that that start making a weird engine sound are then traded in at the dealer because you want them to deal with your non-peace problem, not you? Um, And then you you, you drive home this new peace vehicle that doesn't make any sounds and then you get in a car accident or you run over a rock or that car starts making sounds. And so we, we've, we thought that this purchase was going to bring us peace, yet it doesn't. Uh, my, my cell phone the other day went just black in the middle of something, and then it turned back on. And, and literally the thought the next hour later was like, I'm going to go buy a brand new phone right now because I don't want to worry about it. I, I want to have peace with this device that we're married to that we have to have working at all times. And we, we, we look for peace in material things. We look for peace in our retirement accounts. If I could just get to this amount or have this much stuff, then, then I'll be at peace. I'll be able to relax. But we know it's not true. It is just like the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. A man comes up to Jesus and says, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And you know the story. Essentially, he's asking, What must I do to have peace? I have everything I need, but I don't have peace. And so Jesus says, Why do you ask me about what is good? 
there is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? Now, Jesus is going to give him commandments, but you and I both know he's not giving this man a, a checklist to follow. He, he's revealing his heart. And so Jesus says, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man says, all these I have kept, what do I still lack? Jesus knew his answer. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Jesus says, take your possessions that have brought you all this joy and happiness sell them, give it away, and follow me. That's your peace. If you really want to know what your peace is, that's where it's at. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. His peace was in his possessions, but it was not real peace. He was lost. And so we, we learn quickly that we do not find peace in possessions. There is nothing that, that we can hold in our hands in this world that will bring us peace. It is only our faith in a Savior who loves us and cares for us. If this is you this morning, if you are guilty of seeking peace in people, if you are guilty of seeking peace in possessions, then, then just give that to the Lord. Lord, forgive me for my lack of trusting in you. Forgive me for my hope in worldly things. Give that to God. Peace uh, there is no peace apart from him. What people are saying, 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, what people are saying, there is peace and security. Sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Peace in God is everything. The psalmist says, in peace I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me dwell safely. In Proverbs, the fear of the Lord leads to life and whoever has it rests satisfied. He will not be visited by harm. Job says, agree with God and be at peace. John 14, 27, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives it to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. <clears throat> and then I want you to think of the disciples. They didn't understand peace as they watched the one they gave their lives to follow be crucified. They, they didn't understand peace when the one whom they, they have given up everything, they watched him in his innocence be nailed to a cross. And then they, they, they didn't understand peace when uh, all of a sudden this tomb is empty the third day and they're, they're still trying to figure out what is going on here. But then three days later, Jesus shows up to them and the first word he says to them is peace. Peace be with you, John, John 20, 19. Peace to you, Jesus says in Luke 24. Thomas says, I, I got to see it myself. I got to put my hands in his, the holes where the nails were. I got to touch the scar in his side. And Jesus goes to Thomas and says, peace to you, Thomas. The first words that, that the Prince of Peace says is peace. All the fear, all the confusion, all the lost hope, where many of you and I find ourselves often in this life, is gone in a second as the Prince of Peace stands before them and they touch the scars in his hands. They see the sacrifice he made for them, but that he is alive, that he has conquered death. Jesus is the only true peace that you and I will ever have and experience in this life. We have to understand and grasp peace to its core. So we started in Isaiah. We started in Isaiah chapter 26, primarily verse 3. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. We took uh, this simple call to peace. We, we did uh, quite the detour, if you will. But, but you know when you make a detour, how much sweeter it is to arrive at home. Many of you had to drive the Lion's Trail this week. And, and how sweet it is when you make it home after the, the not going through the canyon. I don't know what's going on in all, everyone's lives this morning. I don't know what is uh, keeping you from peace in all circumstances, at all times, in every way. A marriage, an addiction, finances, health, kids, family, job, you name it. We all have struggles that are keeping us from being at peace with God. But unless you belong to Christ, you are never going to experience true peace. 
Unless you, you give that situation over to Christ, you are never going to find peace in it. Unless you allow Christ to work in your marriage and, and to have him as the, the foundation of it, you're going to lack peace in that marriage. Unless you allow Christ to bring you through that addiction, the things of this world are, are going to lure you back in. Unless you have Christ to, to guide your finances and your health and you trust in him, you're going to lack peace. It goes on and on. There won't be peace in any of those things unless you are at peace in and with Christ. As our mind is stayed on him, the fruit of peace in your life is going to be clear. This fruitful life is going to blossom with peace as you trust in him. As the world is getting worked up over things, you're going to be at peace. As your kids break another piece of furniture or another hole in the wall, whatever it is, you're going to be at peace because you're looking to glory. Your boss changes your schedule again, you're at peace because you're looking beyond the, the, the circumstances of this life. The doctor tells you you need surgery, you're at peace because you know that God is with you, not just today, but into eternity. The doctor tells you you can't have surgery, that, that this is inoperable. You're at peace because you know that God will bring you into his kingdom through his son. It's peace at all times and every way because of the peace we have in Christ. God will keep you, God will keep me at peace when our minds are stayed on him, when they're fixed on him. He is our peace. When we live this way as a church, as individuals, when we display uh, this kind of peace in our lives, we will look drastically different than the world. They're going to see something that makes no sense in a materialistic, selfish-driven world. And that is perfect. Because we are giving them a glimpse of the Prince of Peace. We are giving them a glimpse of the one whom Isaiah said, on the government of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And so we live it out. Perfect peace found in a perfect God. May you and I rest in that peace this morning and may you and I display that peace well. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, what a gift of your son, the, the prince of peace, you made manifest among us to deliver us from all the darkness, all the trials. Lord, may we rest in the peace we have in you. May we not turn to people. May we not turn to possessions. May we not turn to anything in this world for peace, knowing that you are our everlasting peace and hope and comfort. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.